Chapter 20. Have you had your lunch? This part is not good to read if you've just eaten. I expected a moat filled with alligators, a wrought iron portcullis, perhaps possibly some vats of boiling oil. In my mind, I'd built up the Tower of Nero as a fortress of darkness with all the evil trimmings. Instead, it was a glass and steel monstrosity of the ordinary midtown variety. Meg and I had surfaced from the subway about an hour before sunset, luxuriously early by our standards. Now we stood across 7th Avenue from the tower, observing and gathering our nerve. The scene on the sidewalk out front could have been anywhere in Manhattan. Annoyed New Yorkers, New Yorkers jostled past groups of gawping tourists. Kebab-scented steam wafted from a halal food cart. Funk music blared from a Mr. Softy ice cream truck. A street artist hawked airbrushed celebrity paintings. No one paid any special attention to the corporate-looking building that housed Triumvirate Holdings Limited, and the doomsday button that would destroy the city in approximately 58 minutes. From across the street, I spotted no armed guards, no monsters or germanium patrol, just black marble pillars flanking a plate glass entrance, and inside, a typical oversized lobby with abstract art on the walls, a manned security desk, and glass turnstiles pr protecting access to the elevator banks. It was after 7 p.m., but employees were still leaving the building in small clusters. Folks in business suits clutched briefcases and phones as they hurried to catch their trains. Some exchanged pleasantries with the security guy on their way out. I tried to imagine those conversations. Bye, Caleb. Say hi to the family. See you tomorrow for another day of evil business transactions. Suddenly, I felt as if we'd come all this way to surrender to a brokerage firm. Meg and I crossed at the crosswalk. God forbid we jaywalk and get hit by a car on our way to a painful death. We attracted some strange looks from other pedestrians, which was fair since we were still dripping wet and smelled like a troglodyte's armpit. Nevertheless, this being New York, most people ignored us. Meg and I didn't speak as we climbed the front steps. By silent agreement, we gripped each other's hands as if another river might sweep us away. No alarms went off, no guards jumped out of hiding, no bear traps were triggered. We pushed open the heavy glass door and walked into the lobby. Light classical music wafted through the chilly air. Above a security desk hung a metal sculpture with slowly swirling primary colored shapes. The guard bent forward in his chair, reading a paperback, his face pale blue in the light of his desktop monitors. Help you, he said without looking up. I glanced at Meg, silently double checking that we were in the right building. She nodded. We're here to surrender, I told the guard. Surely this would make him look up, but no, he could not have acted less interested in us. I was reminded of the guest entrance to Mount Olympus through the lobby of the Empire State Building. Normally, I never went that way, but I knew Zeus hired the most unimpress unimpressible, disinterested beings he could find to guard the desk as a way to discourage visitors. I wondered if Nero had intentionally done the same thing here. I'm Apollo, I continued, and this is Meg. I believe we're expected, as in hard deadline at sunset or the city burns. The guard took a deep breath, as if it pained him to move. Keeping one finger in his novel, he picked up a pen and flapped it on the counter next to the sign-in book. Names. IDs? You need our, our IDs to take us prisoner? I asked. The guard turned the page in his book and kept reading. With a sigh, I pulled out my New York State junior driver's license. I suppose it, I shouldn't have been surprised that I'd have to show it one last time, just to complete my humiliation. I slid it across the counter. Then I signed the logbook for both of us. Names? Lester, Apollo, and Meg. Here to see, Nero. Business, surrender. Time in, 7.16 p.m. Time out, probably never. Since Meg was a minor, I didn't expect her to have an ID, but she removed her gold scimitar rings and placed them next to my license. I stifled the urge to shout, are you insane? But Meg gave them up as if she'd done this a million times before. The guard took the rings and examined them without comment. He held up my license and compared it to my face. His eyes were the color of decade-old ice cubes. He seemed to decide that, tragically, I looked as bad in real life as I did in my license photo. He handed it back, along with Meg's rings. Elevator 9 to your right, he announced. I almost thanked him. Then I thought better of it. Meg grabbed my sleeve. Come on, Lester. She led the way through the turnstile to Elevator 9. Inside, the stainless steel box had no buttons. It simply rose on its own as soon as the doors lid closed. One small mercy... No elevator music, just the smooth hum of a machinery, as bright and efficient as an industrial-grade meat slicer. What should I expect when we get to the top? I asked Meg. 
I imagined the elevator was under surveillance, but I couldn't help asking. I wanted to hear Meg's voice. I also wanted to keep her from sinking completely into her own dark thoughts. She was getting that shuddered expression she often had when she thought of her horrible stepfather, as if her brain were shutting down all the non-essential services and boarding itself up in preparation for a hurricane. She pushed her rings back on her middle fingers. Take whatever you think might happen, she advised, and turn it upside down and inside out. This was not exactly the reassurance I'd been hoping for. My chest already felt like it was being turned upside down and inside out. I was unnerved to be entering Nero's lair with two empty quivers and a waterlogged ukulele. I was unnerved that no one had arrested us on sight, and that the security guard had given Meg back her rings, as if a couple of magical scimitars would make absolutely no difference to our fate. Nevertheless, I straightened my back and squeezed Meg's hand one more time. We'll do what we have to. The elevator door slid open and we stepped into the imperial antechamber. Welcome! The young lady who greeted us wore a black business suit, high heels, and an earpiece in her left ear. Her luxurious green hair was tied back at a ponytail. Her face was made up to give her a rosier, more human complexion, but the green tint in her eyes and the points of her ears gave her away as a dryad. I'm Aracia. Before you meet the emperor, can, can I get you a beverage? Water? Coffee? Tea? She spoke with forced cheerfulness. Her eyes said, help, I'm a hostage. Um, I'm good, I said, a feeble lie. Meg shook her head. Great, Aracia lied in return. Follow me. I translated this to mean run while you can. She hesitated, giving us time to reconsider our life choices. When we did not scream and dive back into the elevators, she guided us toward a set of double golden doors at the end of the hallway. These opened from within, revealing the loft space slash throne room I'd seen in my nightmares. Floor to ceiling windows provided a 360 view of Manhattan at sunset. To the west, the sky was blood red over New Jersey, the Hudson River a glowing purple artery. To the east, the urban canyons filled with shadow. Several varieties of potted trees lined the windows, which struck me as strange. Nero's decorating taste usually tended more toward gold filigree and severed heads. Rich Persian rugs made an asymmetrical checkerboard across the hardwood floor. Rows of black marble pillars supported the ceiling, reminding me a bit too much of Kronos' palace. He and his titans had been all about black marble. That was one reason Zeus insisted on Mount Olympus's strict building codes that kept everything blinding white. The room was full of people, carefully positioned, frozen in place, all staring at us, uh, at us as if they'd been practicing on their marks for days, and Nero had shrieked only seconds ago, Places, everyone! They're here! If they started in on a choreographed dance number, I was going to dive through the nearest window. Lined up on Nero's left were the eleven young demigods of the Imperial household, aka the evil Von Trapp children, all wearing their best purple-trimmed togas over fashionably tattered jeans and collared shirts. Perhaps because t-shirts were against the dress code, one of the family welcomed important prisoners to be executed. Many of the older demigods glared at Meg. On the emperor's right stood a dozen servants, young ladies with serving trays and drink pitchers, buff young men with palm frond fans, though the room's AC was set to Antarctic winter. One young man, who had obviously lost a bet, was massaging the emperor's feet. Half a dozen Germani flanked the throne, including Gunther, our buddy from the Acela ride into New York. He studied me, as if imagining all the interesting and painful ways he could remove my head from my shoulders. Next to him, at the Emperor's right hand, stood Lugaselwa. I had to force myself not to sigh with relief. Of course she looked terrible. Steel braces encased her legs. She had a crutch under each arm. She wore a neck brace as well, and the skin around her eyes was a raccoon mask of bruises. Her mohawk was the only part of her that didn't appear damaged. But considering that I'd thrown her off a building only three days before, it was remarkable to see her on her feet at all. We needed her for our plan to succeed. Also, if Lou had ended up dying from her injuries, Meg probably would have killed me before Nero got the chance. The emperor himself lounged on his gaudy purple sofa. He had exchanged his bathrobe for a tunic and traditional Roman toga, which I suppose wasn't much different from his bedwear. His golden laurels had been recently polished. His neckbeard glistened with oil. If his expression had been any smugger, the entire, spe the entire species of domestic cats would have sued him for plagiarism. Your Imperial Majesty, our guide, Arcea, tried for a cheerful tone, but her voice cracked with fear. Your guests have arrived. Nero shooed her away. Arcea hurried to the side of the room and stood by one of the potted plants, which was... Oh, of course. My heart thumped with sympathetic pain. Arcea was standing by an Arcea palm, her life force. 
The emperor had decorated his throne room with the enslaved, potted dryads. Next to me, I could actually hear Meg's teeth grinding. I presumed the dryads were a new addition, maybe put here just to remind Meg who held all the power. Well, well, Nero kicked away the young man who had been giving him a foot massage. Apollo, I am amazed. Lucasel was shifted on her crutches. On her shaved scalp, veins stood out as stiff as tree roots. You see, my lord, I, I told you they would come. Yes, yes, you did. Nero's voice was heavy and cold. He leaned forward and laced his fingers, his belly bulging against his tunic. I thought of Dionysus staying in a schlubby dad bod as a form of protest against Zeus. I wondered what Nero's excuse was. So, Lester, after all the trouble you've caused me, why would you roll over and surrender now? I blinked. You threatened to burn down the city? Oh, <laughs> come now. He gave me a conspiratorial smile. You and I have both stood by and watched cities burn before. Now, my precious Meg here. He regarded her with such tender warmth I wanted to vomit on his Persian rug. I can believe she might want to save a city. She is a fine hero. The other demigods of the Imperial household exchanged disgusted glances. Clearly Meg was a favorite of Nero's, which made her an enemy of everyone else in her loving, adopted family of sociopaths. But you, Lester... Nero continued, No, I can't believe you've turned so noble. You can't change thousands of years of nature so quickly, can we? You wouldn't be here if you thought it wouldn't serve you. He pointed at my sternum. I could almost feel the pressure of his fingertip. I tried to look agitated, which wasn't hard. Do you want me to surrender or not? Nero smiled at Lugaselwa, then at Meg. You know, Apollo, he said lazily, it's fascinating how bad acts can be good and vice versa you remember my mother agrippina terrible woman always trying to rule for me telling me what to do i had to kill her in the end well not me personally of course i had my man and acetus do it he gave me a little shrug like mothers am i right anyway matricide was one of the worst crimes for a roman yet after i killed her the people loved me even more I stood up for myself, showed my independence. I became a hero to the common man. Then there were all these stories about me burning Christians alive. I wasn't sure where Nero was going with all this. We'd been talking about my surrender. Now he was telling me about his mother and his Christian burning parties. I just wanted to get thrown in a cell with Meg, preferably untortured, so Luke could come by later and release us and help us destroy the whole tower. Was that too much to ask? But when an emperor starts talking about himself, you just have to roll with it. You could be there for a while. You're claiming those Christian burning stories weren't true, I asked. He laughed. Of course they were true. The Christians were terrorists, sought to undermine traditional Roman values. Oh, and they claimed to be a religion of peace, but they fooled no one. The point is, real Romans loved me for taking a hard line. After I died, did you know this? After I died, the commoners rioted. They refused to believe I was dead. There was a wave of rebellions, and every rebel leader claimed to be me, reborn. He got a dreamy look in his eyes. I was so beloved. My so-called bad acts made me wildly popular, while my good acts, like pardoning my enemies, bringing me empire, peace, and stability, those things just made me look soft and got me killed. This time, I will do things differently. I will bring back traditional Roman values. I will stop worrying about good and evil. The people who survive the transition, they will love me like a father. He gestured to his line of adopted children, all of whom knew enough to keep their expressions carefully neutral. That old metaphorical skink was trying to claw its way into the back of my throat. The fact that Nero, a man who had killed his own mother, was talking about defending traditional Roman values that was just about the most Roman thing I could imagine. And the idea that he wanted to play daddy to the entire world made my guts churn. I pictured my friends from Camp Half-Blood forced to stand in rows behind the Emperor's servants. I thought of Meg falling back in line with the rest of the Imperial household. She would be the twelfth, I realized. Twelve foster children to Nero, like the twelve Olympians. That couldn't be a coincidence. Nero was raising them as young gods in training to take over his nightmarish new world. That made Nero the new Kronos, the all-powerful father who could either shower his children with blessings or devour them as he wished. I had 
badly underestimated Nero's megalomania. Where was I? Nero mused, coming back from his pleasant thoughts of massacre. The villain monologue, I said. Oh, now I remember. Good and bad acts. You, Apollo, are here to surrender, sacrificing yourself to save the city. Seems like a good act. That's exactly why I suspect it's bad. Lucasella? The gall didn't strike me as someone who flinched easily, but when Nero yelled her name, her leg braces squeaked. My lord. What was the plan? Nero asked. Frost formed in my lungs. Lou did her best to look confused. M my lord? The plan, he snapped. You let these two go on purpose. They turned themselves in just before my ultimatum deadline. What were you hoping to gain when you betrayed me? My lord, no, I... Seize them! The throne room choreography suddenly became clear. Everyone played their parts beautifully. The servants backed away. The demigods of the imperial household stepped forward and drew swords. I didn't notice the Germani sneaking up behind us until two, until two burly giants gripped my arms. Two more took hold of Meg. Gunther and a friend grabbed hold of Lugaselwa with such gusto her crutches clattered to the floor. Fully healed, Lugaselwa doubtless would have given them a good fight. But in her current condition, there was no contest. They pushed her down, prostrate in front of the emperor, ignoring her screams and the creaking of her leg braces. Stop it, Meg thrashed, but her captors outweighed her by several hundred pounds. I kicked my Dramani in the shins to no avail. I might as well have been kicking a forest bull. Nero's eyes gleamed with amusement. You see, children, he told his adopted eleven, if you ever decide to dispose me, you'll have to do much better than this. Honestly, I'm disappointed. He twirled some whiskers in his chin beard, probably because he didn't have a proper villain's mustache. Let's see if I have this right, Apollo. You surrender yourself to get inside my tower, hoping this convinces me not to burn the city while also making me lower my guard. Meanwhile, your little army of demigod musters at Camp Half-Blood, he smiled cruelly. Yes, I have an ungood authority they're preparing to march. So exciting. Then when they attack, Lugaselwa frees you from your cell, and together, in all the confusion, you somehow manage to kill me. Is that about it? My heart clawed at my chest like a troglodyte at a rock wall. If Camp Half-Blood was truly on the march, that meant Rachel might have gotten to the surface and contacted them, which meant Will and Nico might also still be alive, and still with the troglodytes. Or Nero could be lying. Or he could know more than he was letting on. In any case, Lucaselva was exposed, which meant she couldn't free us or help us destroy the Emperor's fashes. Whether or not Nico and the Trogs managed their sabotage, our friends from camp would be charging to their own slaughter. Oh, and also I would die. Nero laughed with delight. There it is! He pointed to my face. The expression someone makes when they realize their life is over. You can't fake that. So beautifully honest. And you're right, of course. Nero, don't! Meg yelled. F father The words seemed to hurt her, like she was coughing up a chunk of glass. Nero pouted and spread his arms, as if he would welcome Meg into his loving embrace if it weren't for the two large goons holding her in place. Oh, my dear sweet daughter, I am so sorry you decided to be a part of this. I wish I could spare you from the pain that is to come, but you know very well. You should never anger the beast. Meg wailed and tried to bite one of her guards. I wished I had her ferocity. Absolute terror had turned my limbs to putty. Cassius, Nero called. Come forward, son. The youngest time he got hurried to the dais. He couldn't have been more than eight years old. Nero patted his cheek. There's a good boy. Go and collect your sister's gold rings, will you? I hope you will put them to better use than she did. After a moment's hesitation, as if translating these instructions from Nero sees, from Nero ease, Cassius jogged over to Meg. He carefully avoided her eyes as he worked the rings from her middle fingers. Cass! Meg was weeping now. Don't! Don't listen to him! The little boy blushed, but he kept working silently at the rings. He had pink stains around his lips from something he'd been drinking. Juice? Soda? His fluffy blonde hair reminded me. No. No, I refuse to think it. Ugh, too late! Curse my imagination! He reminded me of a young Jason Grace. When he had tugged both rings free, Cassius hurried back to his stepfather. Good, good, Nero said with a hint of impatience. But come on, you've trained with scimitars, have you not? Cassius nodded, fumbling to comply. Nero smiled at me, rather like the MC of a show. Thank you for your patience for experiencing technical difficulties. 
You know, Apollo, he said, there is one saying I like from the Christians. How does it go? If your hands offend you, cut them off. Something like that. He looked down at Lou. Oh, Lou, I'm afraid your hands have offended me. Cassius, do the honors. Lucas Elwa struggled and screamed as the guard stretched her arms in front of her, but she was weak and already in pain. Cassius swallowed, his face a mixture of horror and hunger. Nero's hard eyes, the eyes of the beast, bored into him. Now, boy, he said with a chilling calm. Cassius summoned the golden blades. As he brought them down on Lou's wrist, the whole room seemed to tilt and blur. I could no longer tell who was screaming. Lou, or Meg, or me. Through a fog of pain and nausea, I heard Nero snap, Find your wounds! She won't get to die so easily. Then he turned the eyes of the beast on me. Now, Apollo, let me tell you the new plan. You will be thrown into a cell with this traitor, Lugaselwa, and Meg, dear Meg, we will begin your rehabilitation. Welcome home.